Am I in the right spot? <laughs> You're in the right <laughs> spot. So, Bill, thanks a lot for coming. Thank you for that obituary. <laughs> <laughs> so, re do you remember how we met? I do. I do. It was uh, sometime in 2005. And I was at Fossil at the time, working on a lot of this sort of wearable concepts. And, uh, and really, kind of the, the concept of glance was what we were focusing on, a glanceable device. I always thought watches were the world's greatest glanceable display, and I thought that there was an opportunity for watches to do more in that area. And I happened to stumble across your blog, and that's exactly what you were talking about. And, you know, I think during the early stages of industries like this, um, you know, innovators tend to find each other this way. They just, uh, it's not an accident. And uh, so I reached out and uh, told you our trade secrets. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the so, rest is history. So the, the way to make friends is you send a <laughs> confidential roadmap to a stranger. And that's what happened. I got this sort of uh, connected Bluetooth watch roadmap in my inbox. And, uh, you know, hey, I'm Bill from, uh, from Fossil. And, and from there, uh, you know, great, great friendship was, was forged, you know, with the first email. Yeah, but there's a, I think there's an important point about that. At the early stages of these kinds of categories, the worst problem you have is no competition. Uh, so I wasn't worrying about competition. I was worrying about having no competition, and I was hoping you would take the bait. <laughs> <laughs> which, which took me 10 years. Uh, uh, but, but I mean, but that wasn't the first time you did wearables. So, so you know, let's, let's go to the first time. Yeah, so I guess this uh, journey for me began in the mid-90s. I had been uh, an entrepreneur. I had a company that was creating technology hubs for initially the IBM AS400 market, and then evolved into token ring and ethernet. And that got acquired by uh, a publicly traded Israeli company called Line Optics. And so um, once I left that, my time during the transition period was over, I'd been a competitive swimmer for years growing up as a kid and through college. And um, you know, I was 40 years old. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And uh, so I jumped back in the pool. And every day as I was walking through the gym to the pool, I saw Stairmasters and bike machines and lots of different devices that had blinking lights telling you how far, how fast, how many. And I decided I'd build a how far, how fast, how many for swimmers and triathletes. And, a couple of years later, I launched uh, really the first swim analyzer, if you want to call it that, a watch. Uh, and I did it under the Speedo brand. And that was on the wrist. So a tracker. It was a, it, it was a watch. Wearable watch tracker back in what, 95, 90, or uh, no, two, uh, I actually 97. Launched, it was, yeah, it was launched at the uh, Ironman Triathlon uh, Championships in Hawaii in October of 97. And then uh, kind of a soft launch, secondary launch at the World Swim Championships in Perth in January of 98. It, it really, so, you know, I, I wasn't thinking of building a smart watch. I wasn't, I was just thinking of building a better watch. And that's what I've been doing for the last mm -hmm. 20 years. Is so so let, let's fast forward to, to, to present day. So, so, so now you're doing MetaWatch. So what on earth is that? So... MetaWatch um, is a company that was formed in August of 2011. It's based here. Um, we have uh, all of our R&D is done in Finland. We have our commercial operation in Dallas, Texas. And it was formed via the acquisition of Fossil's watch technology division, which I had run. And what we really do is we provide smartwatch technology to both consumers and businesses alike. So 20 years of Wearables. So, three <laughs> lessons for these, uh, you know, brilliant minds and youngsters at, uh, at at Slush. So, you know, I've learned something along the way, and and, you know, after 20 years, I'm about halfway there. You know, there's a lot more to learn. You think a watch is a really simple device, and it is the most complicated device I've ever encountered, and that is 
But what I've learned is people don't buy watches because of what they do. They buy them for a myriad of emotional reasons, of which telling time is usually an alibi. Um, they buy them for a lot of other reasons. And so with strokes, I learned a couple of important lessons. First of all, you know, I was dealing with a competitive swimmer who is, um, you know, the amount of time between sets in, in swim training might range between one and three seconds. So, you know, you swim 10 times 200 on a certain interval. You finish the first interval, you've got three to five seconds tops before you're pushing off and doing the next one. You want to give them some meaningful information. And what I learned there is less is more. A watch has got a tiny display. You know, the swimming engineer in me wanted a core dump on them and give them everything in the world. But you got a couple of seconds and a glance to absorb everything. So you have to be ruthlessly disciplined in what you deliver in a glance. Uh, you have to, and that takes a lot of guts. Because so fo focus glancing is one. Focus right. glancing is second one. Second one? The second one was brand synergy is a force multiplier. And what I mean by that is you think of a swimming device and you think of the world's greatest swimming brand, Speedo. That really went together. Now okay, so that, that's great. So, so how on earth could you, you know, you, you know, uh, tall, <laughs> you know, young guy from somewhere just, you know, walk up to Speedo, the, you know, premier brand and say, hey, how did you do that deal? I'm very persuasive. <laughs> I, I thought I had a good story. And, um, you know, the fellow that ran their equipment division um, was a world, former world record holder. I, I, knew, I knew everything about him. Right. And, uh, and I knew the sport. I mean, I, I knew the sport from, call it the physics angle of sport. I knew, underst understood what makes the greatest swimmers the greatest swimmers. And, uh, and was able to put it together in a very simple message. So I understood the territory, and I had a very, very simple device that fit into their business model. That's something right. else I'll talk yeah. about in a second. So then uh, third lesson you learned so far. Well, so let's fast forward to my days at Fossil. I came in yeah. Fossil at, in uh, 2004, and I was brought in to repair or turn around their previous initiatives with uh, the Microsoft SpotWatch and also PalmWatch, both of which were engineering marvels and commercial disasters. And, uh, and the reality was they'd never make money. They were upside down projects. And so what I learned is, number one is, when you try to bring disruptive technology into a company or an industry like the watch industry, which has very mature sales channels, very well honed um, uh, supply chains, and a very rigid cost margin structure, you have to be able to take this disruptive technology and plug into it in a very non-disruptive way. And that's hard. That's really hard. That's, that's by and large what we've been working on for the last eight years is building a supply chain that sort of encompasses all of that. Um, the other thing I learned is um, it's not a wearable if nobody wants to wear it. And what I mean by that is the most important feature is sexy. You know, I heard someone talking on an, an earlier talk today about uh, the abandonment rate of wearables. Like some high percentage stops wearing uh, a wearable device inside six months. And I believe it. And, and I believe it because there, most of these devices have been sold based purely on utility and function. Well, there's lots of tools that we have in our lives, like shovels. I, I don't fall in love with a shovel. You know, I buy it for a purpose, and it does something. But, you know, I've had Breitlings, I've had Omegas, I'm a watch guy at heart, I love the watch industry. I love those products. And it's, it has nothing to do with what they do. It has to do with they strike an emotional chord. And that's the... That's the ingredient that I found is probably the most important ingredient of all is in a wearable, you have to be really good at two disciplines. One is engineering and the other is seduction. And this is what's interesting to me about 
this sort of impending battle I see between Silicon Valley and let's call it the Swiss Watch Valley, is that you've got one world that is the world's best engineering culture, uh, innovation, technology, and so on, and the other one is absolutely the best uh, place in the world for creating objects of desire. You know, the Swiss, uh, an expensive watch, a uh, watch manufacturer, let's say you spend 10, 20, 30,000 euros on a watch, they really don't care whether you need it. All they care about is that you want it, and they know how to make you want it. And that's a very, that's a necessary skill in the wearable business. So, so I think that, that uh, you know, if, if you think of U US, Asia, and Europe, you know, what we have going for us is, is we're sort of the zone of aspiration. So, so we have these aspirational brands, they have the heritage, you know, the, the British heritage, the French heritage, yep. and that's something people are going to pay for. And that's why I was alluding in my intro, you know, to happiness, you know, you buy a Breitling, you're happier, yeah. and it's going to cost you 10,000, and, and you're signaling, you know, I made it. And by the way, I would like to fly jets, but, you know, at least I have the Breitling. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, Enormous disruption challenge coming both from uh, you know the West Coast Apple launching uh, Apple Watch you know uh, Google is uh, 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 Google's kind of entering with with, with a software platform uh, Samsung LG you know striking back I mean this this must be pretty damn exciting for you because you know you you've been around the block and you it is. Yeah. So what's happening next? Well, okay, so let me comment on a couple of things. First of all, um, this is very reminiscent to me of when the personal computer first came out. You know, the personal computer was created by companies like Osborne and Commodore and a bunch of companies that didn't last too long. But it wasn't until IBM jumped in the market that it was perceived to be a real, they validated the category. When IBM came in, it became, it was official. I believe we've just had that, call it IBM PC moment, just, you know, about a month ago, two months ago, when Apple formally announced they are coming in. They have validated the smartwatch category. Up until then, it's been a bunch of Small companies, MetaWatch, Pebble, some big uh, handset companies have jumped in, Samsung, Moto, LG, Sony, and others. But it wasn't until Apple came in that it's really now official. It's not going away. And, and that's a good thing. Um, jewelry has never been mass. In, in 100 plus thousand years of people wearing jewelry, it's never been mass. So we're all not going to wear the same stuff. Um, the wearable market is going to be not only uh, a large consumer market at different price points, but it's also going to be a large commercial market, different industries, different applications, and so on. So what we've seen so far is we've seen the tech industry's point of view of what a smartwatch is. I mean, I, I like the word jewelry, you know. Yeah, yeah, Coro. Coro is <laughs> finished for jewelry. Yeah. It's, and that's the concept yeah. to me, is that, you know, we've got... We get, you know, if you ask Samsung, Apple, all those guys roll up together, they have got a very uniform, almost a, a identical definition of what a smartwatch is. It's color, displays, it's a touch interface, it's apps, and the experience is wearing a mini smartphone on the wrist. We haven't so, seen so the watch industry's response yet, but I think I know yeah. what it's going to be. Yeah, so, so I, I, I think that that, that type of, 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 uh, of battle strikes a real chord with me that, that I've, I've always been interested in what f defines a dominant design. And I don't think we've seen the dominant design. So I don't think Apple's take is a dominant design play. It is, uh, to me, uh, the Apple Watch feels more like what, what we did at Nokia with the Nokia 7650, you know, which was uh, you know, proclaimed to be the first you know, uh, of, of the new era of computing, but we knew at that time that we we're going to go to touch, but we didn't dare to go all the way. And, and, and so uh, I think that, that experience drives, we're, you know, uh, we're visual creatures, you know, we have 20 times more wires to, from our eyes uh, 
and and so this object which where which where the, where the screen wraps around the, the 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 wrist which is more like an armband i think that's the vision i'm working towards i think there's going to be a market for that and and if somebody wants that it's all yours go for it it's coro i i have a different vision i'm i think there's something magical about hands that move analog i love analog analog's not going anywhere it's around for a long long time and I, I think the opportunity, at least for us, is going to be around the very elegant, seamless integration of some digital and analog working in concert. And I think that's exactly how the, the I, I believe the watch industry will, will answer the question, what's a smartwatch? It'll be analog and digital. It'll be glance. It'll be service oriented and services you know, flown to the wrists uh, could be location, could be contextual, lots of different drivers to it. But the real experience is it, you're going to be wearing a watch that's going to have some cool smart features. It's not going to be wearing a phone. No, I, I agree with that. And, and, and I actually think, you know, we might be wearing something on both hands. Okay, I'll take the left. You can have the right. <laughs> Consumers will choose. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So, um, so we're almost out of out of time, um, but uh, so what? What's your take on on uh, on Android? Then you know, Google's going big. They surprised, I guess, everybody in the mobile business by by taking the uh, the, the, the the sort of volume game. You know, what's your take on them in in the uh, you know? Do they have sexy? Um. <laughs> I, I, it reminds me of the Microsoft Spot watch operating system. I, I think that there is, I don't think selling sexy is the end game for them. I think there's another end game in providing Android Wear to OEMs, which is controlling the UX, uh, getting information, and using that information to uh, become a lot more effective at selling us advertising. Um, I think they will have a hard time working with the brands that already exist today because brands want to control what's on the dial. They don't want to delegate that to an open system. So I don't see compatibility with open application kinds of architectures um, and brands. A brand's going to have, or they're going to say, I want this to be my brand. I will control 100% what's on the UI. I will control 100% how it works, or I'm not going to sell that one. So we're, we're out of time, but, but you know what, Bill? Next, we might be proven wrong, both of us.